Have you ever been in a crowded room full of people, maybe at a party or a work event and felt completely alone? Or maybe you've scrolled through social media, seeing everyone's seemingly perfect connections and felt like you're the only one struggling to find your people? If that resonates with you, I want you to know something important. Loneliness isn't a character flaw or a sign that something's wrong with you. It's actually your brain's ancient alarm system trying to protect you. But here's the problem. That same alarm system that once helped our ancestors survive can now trap us into cycles of isolation that are toxic to our mental and physical health. I'm Dr. Tracy Marks, a psychiatrist, and I make mental health education videos to help you strengthen your mind, fortify your brain, and build resilience. In our last video, we talked about managing conflict while staying connected. But what happens when connection itself feels out of reach? Today, we'll look at what loneliness does to your brain and your body and how you can work with your wiring to break the cycle. Here's something that might surprise you. Your brain processes loneliness the same way it processes physical pain. In fact, when researchers put people in MRI scanners and had them recall times of social rejection, the same brain regions lit up as the same as when someone experiences actual physical injury. What were those brain regions? For those who like to know these kinds of details, the anterior cingulate cortex and the right ventral prefrontal cortex these were areas that process the distress of physical pain become active during emotional pain too. But loneliness goes deeper than just emotional hurt. Your brain has an ancient survival system that's constantly scanning your environment for threats. And this system, called neuroception, operates beyond your conscious awareness, automatically assessing whether you're safe or in danger. And when your brain detects social isolation, it interprets this as a survival threat. Think about it from an evolutionary perspective. For thousands of years, being cut off from your tribe meant that you were vulnerable to predators. You had no one to share resources with and you couldn't rely on others for protection. Those who were socially isolated often didn't survive. So your brain developed a powerful alarm system to motivate you to seek connection and avoid isolation. But in our modern world, that ancient wiring can work against us. When you feel lonely, your brain floods your system with stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Your amygdala, your brain's alarm system, becomes hyperactive, constantly scanning for social threats. Meanwhile, your prefrontal cortex, the area responsible for rational thinking and emotional regulation, become less active, making it harder to think clearly or regulate your emotions. And this creates what researchers call the loneliness loop. The more isolated you feel, the more your brain interprets natural social interactions as threatening. Let's say someone doesn't text you back immediately and your hypervigilant brain might interpret it as rejection. A coworker seems distant and you might assume that they don't like you. These interpretations then make you feel more likely to withdraw and increases your isolation, making your brain more threat focused. And there's a physical toll of social isolation as well. When your stress response system is constantly activated, it creates inflammation throughout your body. Lonely individuals show elevated levels of inflammatory markers like interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein. These same markers are associated with heart disease, diabetes, and cognitive decline. So your immune system also takes a hit Chronic loneliness suppresses immune system function while paradoxically increasing inflammatory responses. It's like your body is simultaneously unable to fight off real threats while overreacting to perceived ones. And this might explain why lonely people get sick more often and take longer to recover from illnesses. Sleep becomes another problem. When your brain is hypervigilant for social threats, it has trouble fully relaxing into deep restorative sleep. You might find yourself lying awake, replaying social interactions, wondering if you said something wrong, or feeling anxious about an upcoming social situation. Poor sleep then makes everything worse. You're more emotionally reactive, less able to read social cues accurately, and more likely to interpret neutral interactions negatively. Even your cognitive function suffers. Chronic loneliness has been linked to faster cognitive decline and increased risk of dementia. So when your brain is constantly focused on threat detection, it just has fewer resources available for memory formation and problem solving and creative thinking. So that's all the bad stuff. Here's the hopeful part. 
Understanding how loneliness affects your brain gives you power to work with your wiring instead of against it. The same neuroplasticity that can trap you into isolation can also help you build meaningful connections. So the first step is recognizing that you don't need a huge social network to protect your brain from loneliness. Remember from our first video in this series, your inner support circle is typically consists of just three to seven people. Quality is better than quantity every time. One authentic, supportive relationship can provide more neurological benefit than dozens of superficial connections. And this is especially important to understand if you're an introvert. Your brain might be wired to prefer deeper one-on-one -on -one connections rather than large group interactions. And there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, trying to force yourself into extroverted social patterns might actually increase your stress rather than decrease it. Instead, look for opportunities to connect in ways that feel natural to you. And this might mean having coffee with one person rather than attending a large party or joining a book club where conversation has built-in structure rather than navigating open-ended social gatherings. If you're more extroverted, your brain might crave the energy of group interactions and different types of social stimulation. You might benefit from volunteering, joining sports leagues, or participating in community events where you can interact with multiple people in an energizing rather than draining way. If you've been isolated for a while, the thought of rebuilding social connections might feel overwhelming. Your brain has gotten used to interpreting social situations as threatening, and it's gonna take some practice to retrain those pathways. The key is to start small and build gradually. Begin with what researchers called weak ties, casual but consistent connections with people you see regularly. This might be the barista at your coffee shop or a neighbor that you wave to or someone you see at the gym. These interactions might seem insignificant, but they're actually quite powerful for your brain. They provide low stakes opportunities to practice social interaction and gradually retrain your threat detection system to recognize that most social encounters are safe. You can also try using environmental anchors. Place yourself in situations where repeated natural interactions can occur. This might mean working from the same coffee shop a few times a week, taking regular fitness classes, or walking your dog in the same park at the same time each day. The predictability helps your brain feel safer, while the repetition allows relationships to develop organically over time. When you feel ready for deeper connections, look for structured social activities around shared interests. When you're focused on a common goal or activity, whether it's a hiking group, a cooking class, or volunteer project, the social interaction feels less forced and more natural, and your brain can focus on the task at hand rather than worrying about how you're coming across socially. And don't underestimate the power of giving support to others. When you help someone else, whether it's volunteering or offering practical assistance to a neighbor or just simply listening to a friend, your brain releases oxytocin and activates reward pathways. And this not only feels good, but it also helps you counteract that threat-focused state that loneliness creates. If you've been isolated for an extended period, you might feel like you've lost your social skills, and this is completely normal. Social interaction really is a skill that can get rusty without practice, but like any skill, it comes back with small-scale, consistent practice. Start by reframing interactions as practice sessions rather than performance evaluations. Each conversation is an opportunity to rebuild your social confidence. If an interaction doesn't go perfectly, that's information, not failure. What did you learn? What might you do differently next time? Online communities can sometimes serve as a bridge back to in-person connections, especially if social anxiety has been holding you back. Find your people online first, through forums, social media groups, or apps that are focused on shared interests, and this can help you practice social interactions in lower-pressure environments. And many online connections can then transition to in-person meetings when you feel ready. One thing that's important to recognize, though, is most people are dealing with their own insecurities and aren't scrutinizing your every move as much as your anxious brain might suggest. That person who didn't respond enthusiastically to your comment, they might have been distracted, tired, or dealing with their own social anxiety. 
Your brain's threat detection system will try and make it about you, but most of the time, it's not. Now, let's get real about technology's role in modern loneliness. Social media and digital communication can either help or hurt depending on how you use them. Passive consumption, scrolling through feeds and comparing yourself to others, these tend to increase loneliness and activate your brain's threat detection system. But active engagement, commenting meaningfully, sharing authentically, or arranging meetups can actually support connection. The key is being intentional. Use technology as a bridge to in-person connection rather than a replacement for it. Your brain needs the full experience of social interaction, the nonverbal cues, the shared physical space that you get when you're physically present with another person. And these elements activate your vagus nerve and social engagement system in ways that digital interaction just simply can't replicate. So here's what I want you to try this week. Choose one small step that feels manageable for you. Maybe it's making eye contact and saying hello to someone that you see regularly. Maybe it's reaching out to reconnect with an old friend through a simple text. Or it could be signing up for one structured social activity that interests you. Pay attention to how your brain responds. Notice when your threat detection system tries to talk you out of a connection. Those thoughts that say, they probably don't wanna hear from you, or you'll just act weird. Recognize these as your brain's ancient programming, not accurate reflections of reality. When you do this, you're not just fighting loneliness, you're actively building resilience. Every positive social interaction strengthens neural pathways that support emotional regulation, stress management, and mental flexibility. You're rewiring your brain for connection. But having people in your life is just the beginning. The deepest, most resilient relationships require something more, the ability to truly understand a person's perspective and to see the world through their eyes. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about in our next video, the neuroscience of empathy and perspective taking and how developing these skills transforms not just your relationships, but your brain itself. For now, take that one small step toward connection. Thanks for watching today. I'll see you in the next video.